computer. Okay, and we are here. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, we are talking to Emily Ruddick from the uh, from Mass Creative. Um, you're going to do a way better job than I am of describing what Mass Creative is. So, what role does Mass Creative play in general? Mm -hmm. And then, what role is Mass Creative playing in this crisis? Sure. So, thanks first. Thanks, John, for this conversation, this opportunity to chat. Um, so Mass Creative was founded in 2012 and it was founded at an interesting moment, right? So if we think back in 2012, um, we're a couple years out of the Great Recession crash of 08. Um, and there's been some economic recovery, but what we were seeing was that while there was a lot of creative activity in Massachusetts, the amount of um, public funds and resources and supports to the creative sector just weren't rebounding and responding um, the way that, that other sectors were sort of seeing that happen. And um, artistic and creative leaders from across the Commonwealth really felt like part of the equation was having a group that could help build a strong advocacy voice for the creative sector. Um, you know, I think if you look at any other sector, they, under, they know how to talk about the things that they need and they know how to um, deliver that message effectively to lawmakers and decision makers. Mm -hmm. um, so we were founded to help do that work. Um, and Sorry, my, my coworker is having a little bit of a problem. <laughs> um, so the role that we've played over the last eight years is really about um, helping strengthening the voice of advocacy for the field and providing usable, practical tools for anyone who wants to advocate for arts, culture, and the, you know, the, I, I say the gathering economy, um, bringing people together, um, connecting people through creativity and culture. Um, so in this moment of, so we were doing that, and then March hits and COVID-19 hits, and for us in a lot of ways, it really sort of solidified exactly what we should be doing, which is helping interpret policy for um, practical and direct action. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've seen a lot of bills come out of the out of Congress. We're seeing some movement on the state level in terms of providing relief, providing, um, you know, both in terms of dollars and, and it, as well as thinking about regulation reform that make it possible for all of us to do our lives in this, you know, um, unprecedented moment. And so our job is really making sure that arts advocates and cultural leaders and cultural organizers know what's happening so that they can um, uh, uh, take action and share their stories with lawmakers, um, advocate and educate lawmakers on what particular bills mean to individuals working in the creative sector or organizations that have business in the creative sector. So and I, I want to just make sure to clarify that people understand. So do their voices matter? Absolutely. Okay. 100%. Because so, we are all really good at creative expression. We may not be able, we, we are not always that great at creative expression in defense of ourselves. That's a really good point. And I think, you know, when we were founded, John, one of the things that um, it, it, it was made clear is that Artists and creative individuals are, have always been part of lifting the voices of people who are underrepresented or underserved, except in most cases when it comes to themselves. And um, <laughs> to repeat what you just said. And so um, being helping make clear that not only do you have the right to, to engage with your elected officials, but it's also expected. And it's part of, frankly, like the fabric of our country, right? Is that we, um, you know, lawmakers and elected officials do want to hear what their constituents think on issues. Um, and just as an example, I was talking with a former staffer of a state Senate's office, and she said, um, you know, if a bill gets filed and I hear from an advocacy group, that's good. You know, they usually give me the talking points and the facts. Mm -hmm. But then when that advocacy group is also working with a strong core of advocates and constituents who write to me and tell me how much they care about this issue, 
that's when I start moving it up into the agenda to make sure my boss knows what's happening. So it's funny because this was, I don't know if you know this story, but the reason that I wanted to get more involved with you guys, um, you know, now on the leadership committee and all that kind of stuff, like I, I, not this past arts advocacy day, but the one before that, um, went up to the state house and I had known, I mean, Paul Tucker lives, I mean, from my connection and we went and we talked to him and we talked to Joan Lovely and Mm -hmm. sitting with Paul, it was funny because the number one thing he said was you need to show up more. You, You need to, you need to, you need to call, you need to be, you know, you need to, for lack of a better term, you need to be a bit of a pain in the ass. Yeah. You know, the the if you look at tourism and you look at these other industries exactly to your point, they have a lot of advocates, they have a lot of people calling, they have a lot of people sending letters and emails and you know and and I love advocacy day for what it is and it's powerful and it's a statement and you know the parade and the performances and it's great. Um but you know without you guys who do we have doing that 7 days a week? Cuz all of us are so busy honestly surviving i mean because the the you know even even the most successful you know cultural organizations still have to fight for every penny typically totally. so um that was my ca- catalyst though of like okay i can't do it because mm-hmm. i'm hustling trying to make a living but if i figure out smarter ways to do it through an organization like mass creative then i can i can teach people that you know so That's- Yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you had that eureka moment. You know, and I think, John, to that point is like where Mass Creative is only ever going to be as strong as the as the individuals who who believe in the power of collective action and the advocacy voice. And so, you know, we can, I think we play a really crucial role because to your point, like we're paying attention every day. We're um, thinking, we're also looking nationwide and seeing like, what are other states doing? How are other states addressing the, frankly, challenges in general, but specifically COVID-19 um, and starting to, and using that to help create like, practical, good public policy recommendations that will help us all. Um, You know, I think it's, you know, obviously funding and state funding and public funding is an enormous part of all this, but there are other pieces, everything from like, you know, to file to be an an LLC in Massachusetts is a $500 proposition. We are the highest filing fee in the nation. So what does that say for individual contractors or folks who are trying to think about this? And that's a place where we can advocate and make a recommendation and say, look, in this moment of crisis, let's bring it down to the national average, which is 250, or let's, let's, you know, wave it, or like, let's have it be on a scale, depending on the size of your business. Um, You know, it's not about taking revenues away from the state, but it's about smart public policy that make it possible for more artists and independent contractors and cultural organizations to thrive in Massachusetts. Which which will pay off dividends compared to the $250 that you might be taking off the front end from the fee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm I I absolutely am sure that the assessor's office feels differently about that, but yeah. I mean, but that's just sort of one example. Well, and that's I mean, that's always been the hardest part about creativity in general for me is you can't put that on a spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. can't you know I mean there's you can there is some cause and effect I mean you right. can you can look at something like a you know a theater and say you know specific x amount of money goes into tax revenue and specific x amount of money when yeah. restaurants that surround it but the how do you put positive energy on a on a spreadsheet how do you put in you know how do you put incentivization or influence or you know uh, getting someone to want to take and and spend more time in their local community and and take care of it because of this pub like those things are so unquantifiable one of the challenges with my organization has always been we're really good at unquantifiable stuff but that's so that's one of the things that we you know uh, that i am cribbing from someone else so uh, uh, uh you know this is not my brain yeah. my brain um coming up with this but 
data without story or story without data doesn't get you very far. And so, you know, I think it's interesting, right? Like you're up in Salem, you are next door to one of my, or in within Salem is one of my favorite examples of the power and impact of artists and creativity in the Punta Ur Urban Art Museum, right? You know, you've got a, a, a CDC who sees that there's a negative reputation in that neighborhood, invests money in artists, to make beautiful public murals, but doesn't just stop there and creates a whole festival for those murals that includes um, earning opportunities and income generating opportunities for the residents in the neighborhood. So you've got economic lift, you've got beautification, and then you have like perception of that neighborhood changing. And all of all three of those actually do have, you can attach specific numbers to. Um, and, but the story is also so powerful and, and, you know, it's impossible to walk through that neighborhood and not be moved by the art. And so you see, I, did you mention that yeah. backdrop? <laughs> <laughs> it, it helped jog my mind, but like, to me, those are the examples. Um, and that's what we really try to do is we spend a lot of time talking not only about, you know, it's it, like, what's the return? What's the dollar return for every dollar given to the arts community? How much do you get back? It's around like, for every dollar spent, it's like two thirty dollars are generated, which is great, right? That's a great return. Right. Um, but what does it mean to have a downtown that you're proud of and that is bustling with activity? And that in this particular moment, John, and this is the part that we're starting to think a lot about, that we're excited to get back to. You know, right. like that we, you know, uh, uh, the, I, a concert I have been waiting to go all my life to was postponed for a year. I am so hungry to go see them perform in a year, right? We, we just, we canceled Arts Fest yesterday and Pride's been canceled and Film Fest was canceled and across the state, so many things have been canceled. And, you know, yes, the revenue piece of that is, is scary. Mm -hmm. psychological damage from all of this. I mean, I've had so many people reach out and, and, and not even, again, not even from a revenue perspective, but like, I don't know what to tell my kid. They were really looking forward to that. That is their weekend. That was their highlight. That was, you know, and so what is the, uh, obviously we all want to do it safely, but when we can come together as people, you know, the, honestly for me, like, arts and culture gatherings mm -hmm. are, are critical, critical elements in the psyche of the nation. Yeah, agreed. I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and it's a good reason. So to me, the argument is, right, is like there's a healing benefit, there's an economic benefit, there's, you know, a community connectedness benefit that we all receive from a strong and thriving creative community. And so in this moment in time, I'm spending a lot of time and uh, talking with a lot of people who are committed to making sure that we are preserving as much of our creative ecology and um, as possible so that when we're allowed to safely gather together again, we can still, you know, we can enjoy the diversity and the variety of creativity that's out there. And that's, you know, and the funny thing is, is like, you, you look at it, give me one negative in supporting arts and culture. Oh, I mean, John, I feel like, God bless the 80s, there was a laundry list of reasons why. You know, I, I mean, I think, I think when it comes down to it, oftentimes we get posed with this question of, well, if we do this, then we're not going to be able to fund this other thing. And I don't know that we're it's that black and white it's not that much of a zero sum game and you know one of the things that we've really been thinking about particularly in um responding to COVID-19 is how can mass creative and how can the creative community think a little bit more interconnectedly and intersectionally about our advocacy so a great example of that is um you know people who are living and make their living from the creative economy um, were, have been dealt a really, really hard blow. And things like paying utilities and paying rent or mortgages become increasingly um, stressful questions to ask. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes for um, businesses or, and nonprofit organizations that have commercial leases. 
So it turns out that that's not unique to the creative sector or artists, right? right? That's an issue that a lot of people are facing in Massachusetts. And it's one of the reasons that we joined um, uh, the housing advocacy space to advocate for a bill, the house version of a bill that would put a moratorium on um, evictions due to like lack of rent payments or, or mortgage payments, both you know, um, commercial or personal. And for me, I think that's a great example of like, we don't, you know, we can add our collective voices and collective action to support a larger sweeping issue um, and demonstrate that we're part of the solution too. Right. Um, you know, and, and that that's an example of like, we will, we will receive relief from that. But um, it's not just us. And so it's not about like just funding the creative community or funding another group, you know, sort of saying like a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, it feels to me like the, the smartest movement here is how do we bolster humanity? How do we, you know, like, how do we, we have, I feel like we have all of the assets in place. Right. Not all the parties play well together. And mm -hmm. How do we get them to play well together to not only come through this, but come through this in a better sense than where we were before this all started? You know? Well, I think to that point, right? Like this is, there's not a single person in, in the Commonwealth whose lives have not been touched by COVID-19. Right. Um, whether it's your, your job or um, your, your personal health or the health of a family member. Um, you know, or, or your ability to send your kid to school. Um, you know, everyone's lives have been touched by this. And I think it is this, you know, having a, having a common adversary makes a difference. And so in my most optimistic days, I see this as an opportunity for us to sort of say, um, we can, we need to take care of each other. And there are folks who are even more at risk or more vulnerable. And it's our job to, to notice that and take care of them um, and make sure that we weather this together. And we're, I mean, you're seeing little bits and pieces of that too. I mean, with all the mask making and all of the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I, there's a, um, somebody locally and they're, you know, they started a, their own version of a food pantry at the local coffee shop, you know, and yeah. then another artist dropped off like art supplies that you could also then, take with the pantry items and so like just all of these amazing things I mean there there has been some really humbling inspirational moments come out of this and most of the ones that I've seen are from people that live in our in our industries right which right totally um so let's boring stuff that was like we're gonna change the world and just give yeah. us a hot minute to do it that was great um <laughs> you're welcome um what uh, what kind of opportunities in relief and support are there specific to this crisis for the creative industry types and nonprofit and for profit? Yeah. And what's some of the best places for them to go to kind of like dig through the noise a little bit and get some good information? So um, I think so. It's interesting, right? I think the short, uh, snarky answer to your first question is there's a lot out there, right? And then <laughs> the, to answer your second question, um, there's a lot out there and it's hard to weed through. So, you know, we, I, let me just sort of talk a little bit. So the CARES Act that the feds uh, passed and was signed into law um, three weeks ago now? Yeah, three, almost on Friday, it'll be three weeks, um, included provisions for um, you know, funds that go to the NEA and the NEH and IMLS, which are all um, federal agencies that underwrite arts, culture, creativity, science museums. Um, but more, and that's great. And more importantly, there were provisions like the pay, uh, Payroll Protection Act, the um, emergency, uh, it's EIDL, so it's the disaster loan program that independent contractors can take advantage of, as well as um, for-profit and small and nonprofit small businesses. 
And those are really great. And we, um, again, cheekily, I say, um, policy is great. Policy implementation is the part that's a headache. And so I think over the last couple of weeks, we've seen just how hard that's been. So we've seen how the feds didn't give a lot of guidance for some of those programs as they came online. Folks are having to navigate that. On our website, uh, which is mass-creative.org, we've stood up a whole COVID-19 section. And we, um, thanks to my director of policy, oh, excuse me, my director of programming, Tracy Konopinski, yesterday did a huge overhaul to make it easier and more navig okay. navigable. Okay. So you're gonna find, links to relief funds for individuals across the Commonwealth. You're gonna find some really great how-to guides for unpacking that legislation. Um, and you're gonna find ways to engage creative, creatively um, and get paid for it in some cases. But the thing, so just to um, go back to the CARES Act for a second, the thing that I think is most profoundly interesting um, is that for the first time in the history of the unemployment safety net, um, independent contractors and gig workers are going to be included to apply for unemployment funds. Now that fund is still coming online. We know that uh, last at the end of last week, the state finally got some initial guidance for how that's going to be implemented, and it's not quite ready to go. So those relief funds are a matter even more in this short moment. But um, that that's a huge step forward for us in terms of policy. And since uh, the creative community is sort of the, you know, the home, one of the like first homes of the gig economy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad to see that that was included in the CARES Act. And I think that'll provide real relief. Yeah. So in this, big deal. Yeah. Um, and so as information about that comes online, we're, we'll also post those, you know, we see our role as both helping unpack pieces of policy and help you sort of navigate it, as well as frankly, sort of understanding when we don't have all the answers and directing you to better resources. So we've tried to put together some links and some guides that are the, the best of what we've seen out there. And, uh, you know, plug right now, if anyone looks at it and goes, you got this all wrong, there's a better resource out there ping me, let me know that, and we will we'll update it. We are constantly updating those resources for a reason. Okay. Um, so on the state level, there's, you know, one of the things that I think was really heartening was to see how quickly Governor Baker and leadership in the legislature moved to get the resources that our frontline healthcare workers needed as quickly as possible. And obviously that's a, a longer, larger fight having to do with procuring PPEs from the feds, um, but the first sort of set of COVID-19 related legislation and bills are really focused on that. Um, it's also focused on like making sure government can still happen, right? Like on the municipal, on the local level as well as the state level, because that's important. Um, but I'm starting to gear up and I think we should all be starting to make sure we're paying attention. And by paying attention, I mean, reaching out to your lawmakers now because there's going to be both a state budget that is going to look very different than what their draft budget was at the beginning of March or what the, frankly, what Governor Baker submitted in January. Um, and we're all going to need to make sure that in a moment when state revenues are forecasted to be pretty dramatically de decreased, the creative community is still visible in that document and is still going to receive support. And then the other piece is there's talk of an economic, well, there was an economic development bill that we expected to come out at the end of this session. What that bill looks like now, again, versus what it was going to look like a couple of months ago is very different. And that's another place where we need to make sure we're talking to our um, elected officials and our lawmakers to say, the creative community needs help in this and, and needs to be included in um, any relief or economic stimulus bills that are out there. So, and, and so if people navigate your website, can they figure out how to do that? Totally, totally. So on that COVID-19, we have a whole advocacy you know, page dedicated. And right now it's populated with two asks. One is reach out to your um, state rep and let them know what's happening. And then the other one is part, we talked about this earlier, like the data piece. There's two surveys that we're asking people to engage in. Um, one is for individuals and then the others for organizations. And these are both being run by Americans for the Arts, which is a national organization. The, the ability for us to be able to tell in real time what the, what the um, 
impact has been and what it means to our sector and our ability to recover is so important. And so filling out, if you haven't had a chance to do those surveys, please do them. It makes a real difference, both in terms of helping us sort of quantify and say like, how much are we talking about here? How much do we need to be advocating for? Um, as well as being able to say to lawmakers like, look, you know, the tourism industry is the third largest industry in Massachusetts. The creative community is at the heart of that tourism economy. And if you need, if you want that recovery to, if you want that economy to recover, you got to take care of the people who are at the heart of that economy. Right. Um, good. That's a lot. That's good. Um, it's, it's, it's challenging because you're, you know, as, as amazing as it is that the, you know, the gig workers and the freelancers are getting the unemployment. Um, not only are you trying to like convince them that they can do it, like it's retraining them on how to how to view their industry. Totally. I've seen because they didn't they didn't know like they a lot of them still don't know that they can that there's an unemployment thing coming for them. A right. Them didn't and, and a lot of them have never advocated for themselves. A right. lot of them have never they don't know that's why I wanted to do this with you, you know, to yeah. put the word out there like, you know, we it's interesting. We have such a good ability as creative types when there's a social cause that we all want to come around. You know, if you think about uh, the women's march or pride or whatever, without the creative flourishes and flares and artists and, and floats and all that, like, what would it be? You know, right. yeah. but at the same time, we, we just, we don't do a great job of advocating for ourselves. And so I'm hoping that we can change that as well. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I used to say all the time, like, how do we get a billboard that just says buy local art? Yeah, uh, yeah that's a good point. You know, I, John, I, I want to push back just a little bit because I just, so in, in Massachusetts, there have been some really great examples of leadership and advocacy leadership by individual artists and creatives. So there's an organization called Mass, uh, Massachusetts Artist Leaders coalition and they are in order to be a member of the coalition you have to be a practicing artist or a practicing um, creative entrepreneur um, and they are really the the as i understand it a founding moment for that group had to do with healthcare, right and healthcare reform and making sure that the art artists and indep independent and uh creative entrepreneurs were going to qualify um, for whatever sort of marketplaces were put together and be able to navigate those marketplaces when it, sometimes to your point, like telling the story of our, how we all cobble together our income is not a straight shot. It's not a simple, like, here's my W2. Um, and they did a really great job of, of advocating and educating um, lawmakers and regulatory officials around that issue. So that's a great example, and I highly recommend folks check them out. The um, they are called the Massachusetts Artist Leaders Coalition, MALC for short, and they're a really awesome group. And and we 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 work with them all the time to really try to boost the signal on the work that they're doing. And to your point, I think you're right that there are still pieces of this that feel really confusing to anyone, artist or not, and making sure that we are connecting individuals with the right tools is really great. So I just want to also point out that um, there's a group in Massachusetts called the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. Mm -hmm. yep. They put together a conversation with two, un two employment lawyers to basically help people navigate and think about this unemployment assistance. Um, and they've got a whole suite of uh, uh, guides and how to's around this issue. So we'll, 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 we'll yeah. I'll link to all this stuff as well. Yeah. But, um, but the point remains like, oh, you talk. No, it's, it's, I, the advocacy for, it's, it's challenging to me. The advocacy for, you know, us, being deserving of certain unalienable rights is one thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more saying like, how do we take, you know, uh, you think about all the parades and, and things yeah. that we have and all the big concerts and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, how often do we actually have one just that art matters? Right. Right. Well, That's I mean, what I meant, yeah. it was that it was yeah. that can we, 
this 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 skill set that a lot of these humans have to tell good stories through whatever medium they're using and i go back to um i'm gonna space on her name so my bad but i'll link to it the woman that um did the poem at the creative county initiative summit oh my gosh and i'm blanking on her name too but that that poem, oh was amazing well i'll link to it because i think we have a video of it but that right there like it was just it was probably one percent of one percent of what she does in the course of the year yeah. but she took this one thing to say this is why it matters and right. and that's all i'm saying i'm saying like we have the ability to create things that people pay attention to mm -hmm. and i'm 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 incentivizing and saying you know yeah. Or, or, or when a very important issue comes up, I mean, last, uh, last election cycle, you know, we, we had a bunch of our artists do get out and vote stuff, you know, mm -hmm. we do, you know, your hashtag arts matter, um, camp. Yeah. how do we do that all year? Yeah, that's a really good, you know, I mean, and that's that hashtag arts matter campaign or we, so this is an online day of advocacy around the creative community. Um, it actually was born out of another campaign that we had called Create the Vote, which was about connecting constituents with candidates running for office and making sure that candidates running for office knew how much their constituents um, and potential voters cared about the creative sector and knew um, and heard about the challenges so that they could craft platforms that were inclusive of the creative community. Um, and then we, you know, in the, the first version of that, we found we were struggling to get some airtime and Arts Matter Day was really about sort of trying to break through that noise. And I like, I really appreciate what you're saying is that that's a constant vigilance that we have to have. How do we, how do we move ourselves out of a space of like starving artists and move ourselves into a place which is the reality of we are small business owners, we are entrepreneurs, we are city leaders and city, you know, creators of the version of our next, you know, communities. It's it's that like, and that's to me, it's like some. I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday about what community meant to them. Mm. You know, some people consider you know consider community their church group. Some people consider community what city they live in. Mm -hmm. The people that you just described is what the collective is for me. That's my yeah. community. Yeah. It's and I'm still I'm still constantly begging these people, like, can you just do something so we can just like get the word out about why this all matters so much? Like, mm -hmm. I understand that you don't think that you're paid appropriately or, you know, paid an exposure or whatever. But at the same time, you know, back to Paul Tucker's statement, if you're not advocating for yourself yeah not advocating for your industry and why would anything change why that's a good point but and that's a really interesting line john right is like so we we have a rule at mouse creative which is if we are inviting someone to advocate um and 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 take an action which is outside of their normal course of business or the things that they normally would derive, derive income from, then we believe that that's part of our collective m m work mm -hmm. and that it's, uh, it's only made stronger by more of us joining. If we're asking someone to perform at an arts advocacy day or create a, a new logo for our Arts Matter Day mm -hmm. um, and use the skills that they would normally be paid for and derive their income, then we believe strongly that they get paid for that work. And that's our motto too, everybody gets paid. Yeah. And it's yeah. hard. It, is not hard. it is not easy. When no. you can't convince leadership that programming is worth money and you're also an organization that pays everyone, do you know who ends up losing out on that? The producer. Yeah. Right. The producer always loses out on that. Like, but that's, it's fine. Um, Can I just also say, I just, you know, y the creative collective, your work and the, and the individuals that make up the collective um, have made significant difference. You know, the way that you all are collectively telling the story and changing the narrative is being noticed. Um, so, so, as the external eye, I just want to say, we notice it is extremely appreciated. And I think it's part of the change that we are all looking to see. Well, that's appreciated. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> um, 
All right. Well, Can I tell you about two things? Please. Okay. So the first one is um, we recognize that we are now living in a time of way too long webinars and Zoom calls. Um, but we also recognize that there's really important information that Mass Creative is trying to share as much as possible. So we are on Friday going to do our very first policy and action update. It is 15 minutes, 9.45 a.m., 15 minutes. You'll get the top level things. You'll hear quick ways that you can take action. Um, we will try to answer a couple questions on during the call. If we can't, we'll send them out later. Um, and it's really a way for us to just try and make sure that we are doing our jobs, which is moving information forward and turning it into opportunities to advocate and make your voice be heard. Okay. Um, and that actually just turns out to be the only thing I wanted to say. <laughs> um, I'm in a constant Zoom all day meeting, so. Yeah. I have to run from this. Um, the city of Salem has put together an economic task force, and um, I'm really happy that arts and culture has been part of that discussion. Um, two weeks ago, when uh, Kim Driscoll was looking, Mayor Kim was looking mm -hmm. at you know how to get some relief aid and relief effort, knowing that she was reaching out, talking about how to repurpose creative individuals to get them to provide some solutions and potentially get paid was just really, really hopeful to me. That's awesome. And that's also a really, so part of the work, right, is both sharing what we need and making the ask to elected officials. And then there's another part, which is helping them understand when their actions make significant difference and are helpful. So this is a great local municipal action item is um, to everyone who's watching this, reach out to Mayor Driscoll um, and her office and say, thank you. Thank you for putting together a task force that's inclusive of the creative community. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, I mean, our, our organization spreads beyond Salem. We're based in Salem and I kind of came up in Salem. So a lot of our stuff is here. And I do think a lot of the communities around us look to us for direction. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm excited that it's starting in such a you know, I mean, obviously it's super challenging. There's not a lot of smiles in the meetings, but the energy is there, which is, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So I will link to all the things. I yeah. super, super appreciate this. I think this was great. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the time, John, and the conversation. Of course. And um, I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. See Thanks. you.